This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Whether or not we think that the rate is 10 percent, 20 percent, or 30 percent, I think we can all agree that if the aorta enlarges after endovascular repair, it's a problem. So here to give us some advice about what to do about sac enlargement after aneurysm repair is Dr. Bob Curlin, the professor and chief of our interventional radiology uh, division. Bob. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate being invited to this meeting. It's, uh, you've done it for a few years, and uh, it's certainly a meeting that I enjoy very much. It's good for radiologists to get out. You know, most of you guys in the room don't have the problem if you're flying on an airplane. And, you know, you get friendly with the guy sitting next to you, and he asks you what you do. Now, you guys have no problem. You know, I'm a surgeon. And they, yeah, they get that. Did you know about 60% of the general population in the United States does not believe that radiologists are doctors. <laughs> and I'm not going to have a show of hands of how many surgeons think radiologists <laughs> are doctors. <laughs> I wish also um, to say that I have nothing to disclose. The objectives of my lecture are going to be how we diagnose and how we classify the types of andoleaks. We're going to talk a little bit about their significance. And we're going to focus on the treatment of type 2 endoleaks. I've often been told by my fellows that I have a firm grasp on the obvious. And continued growth of an aneurysm after a repair is a bad thing. And certainly when they rupture, they will lead to death with uh, equivalent rate of those who have not been previously uh, treated. How do you follow these patients? Well, we're here in America, so we don't really have all the tools that are available to developed countries like Europe. But uh, the mainstay that has been used in the United States is contrast enhanced computed tomography. For those of you who listen to CNN or read the New York Times, you understand there is sort of a, a frenzy in the United States now about the amount of radiation that's being used. Some of it's actually justified, and part of it's due to the technological advances in the CT machines, which heretofore were unable to put out enough radiation really to hurt you, but that's not the case these days. And it's also true of the angio machines. Following my talk, Dr. Gould, our physicist, will give some insights as to some of the dangers of radiation to both the patient as well as the operator. But CT scanning remains the gold standard to diagnose uh, endoleaks. It gives a complete morphologic view of the aorta and usually is diagnostic of the type of endoleak. However, if you have somebody who's been stable for a period of time, it's certainly reasonable to use another modality. Certainly in Europe, uh, ultrasound's been used uh, extensively in analyzing whether or not an endoleak is present. They also use liberally ultrasonic contrast agents, which are not widely used in the United States. And I think as time goes on, people will understand, even though endovascular repair has been a great advance. It puts you on a lifelong train of follow-up. I'm not going to ask the audience how many of you go every six months to the dentist to get your teeth looked at or every year, but they have a really good union because I think most people recognize that you got to go to the dentist. But I do think it is problematic in this patient group as it enlarges getting reliable follow-up and ascertaining whether or not the initial therapy has been effective. It was surprising to me um, early on when I realized if you don't have an endo leak, it doesn't mean that you're not going to develop one down the line. And that means type 1, type 2, type 3, and certainly these problems do develop. 
Uh, it is possible with some of the devices which are compatible with MR to use MR, which does not have radiation. And there's variable schedules. Most people obtain a follow-up acutely within a month or so, then at six months, and then at one year, depending on what they find, uh, to follow these patients to see if they have an endoleak. And certainly, it is recognized that endoleaks will occur somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of patients if we exclude the uh, type 4 endoleaks that are seen in the operating room. So it's a significant problem and a big detractor to using this technology to treat patients with aneurysms. Everyone is aware of the basic classification of endoleaks, which is type 1 from the endograph fixation point, type 2 from arteries arising from the aneurysmal sac, type 3 from a graft defect, or the modular junction uh, unions, which you know has become less common as the devices have improved. Type 4 is the graft porosity. And type 5 is a little bit of an enigma, which I'll talk about at the end of this lecture. I won't focus on type 1 endoleaks. Everybody recognized that it's important. The aneurysm sac is pressurized. It turns into a windsock. It increases the chance of acute rupture. And the treatment is generally returning to the suite for an extension or placement of a balloon expandable stent, and no one would disagree that these should be addressed in a somewhat semi-urgent fashion. What I want to focus on is the type 2 endoleaks, which tend to be more problematic, and they've been divided up into two groups as 2A, a single artery, recognizing it's really not possible to have a single artery leading to a type 2 endoleak, because you have to have an inflow or an and an outflow or the patient would explode. But more commonly, you run into patients who have readily identifiable branches which lead to it. But until you have a better morphologic delineation of the endoleak, it becomes really difficult to uh, ascertain with certainty what is contributing to the endoleak itself. Uh, certainly, CT scan is pretty good. It's pretty good. And if you pay attention and you look at the endoleak and you're obtaining both pre-contrast uh, arterial phase as well as delayed scanning, most often you can get to identify the majority of the vessels which are contributing to the endoleak. Um, there can be mistakes, there are differences in the quality of CT scans, and certainly, you know, as radiologists, we're somewhat responsible for the technical refinements in the examination. You can get beautiful studies and see extremely fine details, but it comes at a cost of radiation. So we have to be somewhat judicious in the types of studies that we're performing. But what I want to impress upon you is all CT scans are not equal. Slice thickness and the milliamperage that are applied technically in creating the image have really reasonably dramatic effects with the resolution and the size of vessels that can be seen uh, contributing to the problem. Um, not all two endo, type 2 endoleaks are alike. Uh, studies have been done showing that many type 2 endoleaks do have systemic arterial pressure within the sac. That is true, but they all don't. And certainly it would be uh, sensible to believe that those which have systemic pressure are more likely to enlarge after the placement of the endovascular graft compared to those that are of low pressure. And I believe that, though I have not seen anybody directly correlate that. Uh, everyone also agrees that type 2 endoleaks are reasonably benign. And if you follow the patient and the aneurysm does not increase in size or diminishes, you can continue your observation without doing an additional intervention. It's those patients who increase the sac by five millimeters or more, and that tends to be a common number that is used in the literature for continued expansion of the aneurysm, that some type of intervention is warranted. Now, the question now comes, how are you going to treat these type 2 endoleaks in patients who have continued aneurysm growth? You'd think by now, because this technology has been, you know, around uh, 15 years or so, somewhere around there, uh, that this would have been sorted out. Unfortunately, I am disappointed to tell you that there is not a standard way to manage a type 2 endoleak in a patient with an expanding aneurysm. People certainly have advocated using embolic techniques, and 
gee, over 15 years, you'd figure what was best. These are the things that have been used commonly. And in the literature, in most of the reports, you don't come up with one isolated substance, which makes separation in exactly what's doing what. But people commonly use coils. They use N-isobutocyanoacrylate or glue, thrombin. How much? It varies. Onyx is the new kid on the block. A lot of people are using uh, this embolic agent to treat type 2 endoleaks and in some cases try to fill the sac at the time of deployment of the EVAR. Gel foam, yeah, but you have to realize you're putting in gel foam so that it is swept away into the outflow vessels, hopefully obstructing the vessel. Now, one of the downsides about gel foam is your body will digest it and dissolve it. It is reputed to be a temporary embolic agent. I will tell you, you know, after doing, you know, a lot of gel foam embolization, that if you go back and study those patients, sometimes the vessel is open and sometimes it is not. But it's very difficult to predict who will achieve permanent occlusion when you use gel foam. Fibrin glue, some people use it. I haven't had any experience in this arena, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Here's an interactive question for you. So if the aneurysm sac is continued to enlarge in follow-up imaging, more than five millimeters, and the IMA is patent to its origin from the aneurysm sac, and that could be a little bit tricky, how should the patient be managed? And here are your options. I will give you your 10 seconds to respond. Most people will go with the trans uh, arterial embolization. I think that's the right answer. Um, if the aneurysm's getting larger, I do think you probably should treat it. Uh, none of the above is for those test takers out there. It kind of stands out as an odd answer and usually is the, the right choice in a situation like this. I don't know that we really know, but my choice would have been C. This can be hard. Uh, I do a lot of angiograms, and most of the time when I'm going in there, I'm totally confident that I'm going to get the job done. And I can't really actually recollect failing on this procedure, but it took us a while to sort of tumble to the proper technique. And I'm going to tell you the way I do it. That doesn't mean the way that you should do it, but with the skill set that I brought, this is the technique that I've done. I've put a guiding sheath into the SMA. Following that, I put a glide catheter, usually a cobra, to engage the middle colic artery. And I try to get that glide cobra all the way out to the splenic flexure. And before I tried this, I wouldn't have predicted this was possible. It turns out you can do this in most patients. Uh, because if you have inflow coming down through the IMA, it tends to enlarge. It's like any other vessel. It's serving as a collateral. It's not your standard IMA that's just feeding the left colon. So in most cases, it is possible to get to that location. And then there's a zillion different microcatheters. I'm sure if you go to the next room, you can talk to a number of catheter companies. They love to sell these microcatheters. They're really expensive, and they are different. They vary in their stiffness, and they vary in their lubriciousness. I think it's important to use a microcatheter that has a reasonably soft tip and has a lubricious coating, which will allow you to negotiate some of the curves going down through the descending colon and making that upturn into the aneurysm sac, and that's a critical feature. If you don't reach the aneurysm sac, I think your chances of failure are extremely high. The other thing that I've learned, once I get to the sac, you can't just inject coils. It's fun to inject coils. You can charge for it, but in reality, I don't think it does anything. So unless you're coating your coils with thrombin or you're injecting glue, I think you should consider doing so. And it is very important to get that nice. This is your chance to get in there and either put some small particulate debris or some glue in attempt to allow the flow within the aneurysmal sac to carry it to the outflow vessels. Now, obviously there's bad things that can happen. If you're using glue or you're using thrombin, both skin necrosis, spinal cord damage, and colon infarction have been reported. So 
You want to use enough, but not too much. You also don't want to reflux once everything's occluded down into the inferior mesenteric artery because you're going to go down and you're going to affect the flow to the large bowel, which is certainly a bad thing to do because it requires a lot of yucky surgery after that. You got to use large enough coils. It's very disappointing to blow one of these coils in there and have it bounce back because of your hydrostatic force into like the main artery that's supplying the area. That can be disappointing. Uh, but it's usually possible either by blowing in a little saline or a wire to get it back in the usual position. And finally, in the end, what you want to do is to do a follow-up angiogram to confirm that you've actually done what you set out to do, which is to occlude the endoleak. And doing that, you can be successful the vast majority of the time. Here's another case, and this case is actually pretty interesting. What is the cause of this type 2 endoleak? And, you know, it's sort of fun when you're, you're looking at a lecture, actually, to look at a film and go, you know, if I was looking at this at home, because radiologists do everything from home, I mean, you go in, it's like, it's a big hassle. Um, you go back to bed, it's warm. Um, but if you saw this, if you were looking at these images, what would you say the cause of the endoleak was? Well, it, it turns out that when we did the angiogram and we picked this up uh, before we did the study, you can see that there is a accessory renal artery and going back to this film, you can see the small branch taking origin from the anterior aspect of the aorta. In general, if you see flow <coughs> in a type two endoleak that's in the ventral one half of the aneurysmal sac, you either have an IMA or you have an accessory renal artery. I've never seen this occur in a type 2 endoleak without that being the case. And in this circumstance, obviously, what we want to do is get to the sac, an ideal circumstance to fill up the sac with coils and glue, refluxing the glue into the accessory renal artery, and then coiling the inferior mesenteric as you pull your way out. And when you do get both the inflow, the outflow, and the sac, you have a high level of confidence that that endoleak is going to be managed properly. Now, if you can't get there angiographically, and certainly I have enough gray hair to tell you, translumbar is a totally acceptable approach. And the problem is that people haven't quite sorted out the proper technique to do the translumbar technique. In many centers, this is done under fluoroscopy just the way all us old guys used to do translumbar aortograms by Ron Stoney he said, well, you take four fingers, you go left of the spinous processes, four fingers up from the iliac crest, and you just walk off the bone. And it is true. We did translumbar aortography with that on a very regular basis with a very low complication rate. These guys are a little bit different, though. I mean, they have an aneurysm. And early on, people were doing this, and I'm going, God, no one's ever really shown this is like totally safe. And people were actually talking, and it has been done, going from the front. Now, that always worried me, going through the perineal cavity and the aneurysm might, you know, if you bled, there's a big space in the perineal cavity to fill it up. But people have done that. Why I like to do this under CT is because it is the CT which showed the abnormality, and therefore, I can put the needle tip into the area where the endoleak is. Other investigators have described putting catheters in and sort of fishing around until you get flowing blood. That might be a good thing. I don't know. You're moving the clot around. You might move it into outflow vessels. Not been studied and is unknown. But I know if in the CT scanner, I can go down there, hit the spot, and inject whatever I want. Did you know, even though the majority of time we do this, we put in a catheter, I have done this with small endoleaks just through a 22 gauge needle and you can put microcoils and glue through a 22 gauge needle. And though glue has this reputation of causing a lot of like anxiety and sweat for gluing a catheter in, take this. If you're moving faster than just the slowest thing on a Saturday morning, you will not glue a needle in place going there. It just doesn't seem to stick and you can pull it out, which is very refreshing to know. You can actually <laughs> do this from the, uh, the right side also, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. This is another case more traditionally where we place the needle in under CT, take the patient over 
in the prone position to the angio suite, put a catheter in, fish around, and then try to do everything. There's a certain tactile feedback that you get when you're treating these aneurysms that when you're done, as you inject, the resistance increases and you can actually see the aneurysm that's filled with contrast sort of expand. When you get that, it's certainly a viable endpoint. And most patients where we've come to that have had successful closure of their endoleak. We think, of course, it's a little bit difficult on CT scans afterwards with all these coils to figure out if the endoleak is present. But that's actually been studied, and if, if you look closely and use enough radiation, you can generally figure it out. You can do it from the left side. You can go through the cava. Um, being a radiologist, you know, we're always worried about everything. It's funny, we, we, we worry about things that other, other people don't. Like, when I was doing translumbar aortography diagnostically, I never worried about nerve roots or things like that. But now that I can see nerve roots, it's sort of like, oh, well, I better stay away from that. Sometimes it is possible to insinuate yourself coming from the right between the cava and the aorta. There's a uh, excellent interventional radiologist in Oregon that does all of his endoleaks from the cava using intravascular ultrasound puncturing through the cable wall into the sac with a very high success rate. And I think this is an extremely viable technique. Uh, certainly, if you get a follow-up scan on the next day non-contrast and the aneurysm sac continues to be filled with the contrast which was instilled at the time of therapy, I think that you're fairly confident that it's been done. Now, that's the good news, that it's a lot of fun and technically it's quite effective. Here is the bad news. The bad news is that even though there are a lot of investigators saying that either the uh, translumbar and transarterial technique are highly success and they're very safe and no complication rate. If you go to people who actually have follow-up with their treatment of type 2 endoleaks, it's extremely disappointing. And even though, you know, some people will say, well, you can fix 50, 60 percent, uh, some guys say that you'll fail in 70% of the patients, and these patients do require continued follow-up. And even though you may have fixed it the first time, a substantial number of patients will require a second and sometimes third procedures, which is, I think, the Achilles heel of EVAR, of it does require continued follow-up, and it often requires continued uh, additional procedures but I only think this is temporary. In the future, I think, as the technology improves, we'll get along that. We'll talk about that at the end. Here's another paper showing about a 50% success rate, a little less, using a combination of things. Here's 44% success rate at five years. So it's really been pretty disappointing. Are there alternatives? You know, at, at this point, I think you're obligated to treat patients with continued expansion, whether or not you want to go to Linda's plan B which I think is certainly something to consider in an operative candidate, uh, I think it really depends on the individual patient and their comorbidities. Uh, type 3s, I'm not going to talk about too much. They're basically type 1s. They're generally fixed by putting an additional stent graft in. They have to be fixed because it's generally arterial pressure, which is uh, flowing into the sac. Type 4s, as I mentioned, are more of an artifact during the time of placement. But let's move to type 5s. Now, what is a type 5 endoleak? Um, endotension, and what's that mean? I don't know. I think basically there are two groups of people who carry the diagnosis of type 5 endoleaks. These are patients, one, who actually have an occult leak, and you're just not seeing it because of the timing or the quality of your CT scan. The other group, which I do think is real and exists and probably is the most common cause of this phenomenon, are patients who develop a seroma inside their aneurysm, which over time, depending on what specific device can use due to the osmotic pressure, can continue to draw fluid into the sac. These have ruptured. These have ruptured without terrible adverse events. Uh, they've been drained. People have drained these just by going from a translumbar approach by putting in a, a catheter and drawing off the fluid. But again, it's not worked out the optimal way to take care of this. Um, in the future, in the future, I think there will be device improvements. I'm sure you're all aware of this Nellex device, which has these 
polymer-filled bags. And they don't have a lot of data on this yet, but the early studies suggest that maybe this is an alternative. Maybe this will be better than the devices that we have. Certainly, in the small number of patients that have been reported utilizing this device, the incidence of type 2 endoleaks has been virtually none. There have been a couple of type 1 endoleaks, but it's certainly been an improvement compared to the historical data using the devices which are commercially available. And I just think it's going to await the studies to come out to see if this actually is an improvement. So in conclusion, EVART certainly does require periodic imaging to exclude expansion using the magic five millimeter number over time. The SAC expansion most often is associated with some type of endoleaks. Type one and three endoleaks are no-brainers, need to be treated and fixed. Type twos are the ones that are controversial. I do think that for someone with an IMA leak, it's smarter to, to go the angiographic route to begin with as opposed to the translumbar route. For lumbar, lumbar endoleaks, for those of you who've had the experience of going down the hypogastric and then up the iliolumbar and then really through the sort of no man's land between the communications the lumbar, it's very difficult. Some of those patients I think are best handled by going directly to the translumbar approach. True type five endoleaks, probably, because should be aspirated by the translumbar approach under imaging guidance. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.